Welcome. We'll of course begin as we always do talking about computer arithmetic. As we know, computer math doesn't take place with the infinite world of integers and reals that we, we think about in math. It takes place in a finite field. Uh, that is, there's only a finite number of values that a computer can represent. So for an int in C, that's usually four bytes. Four times eight is 32, it's 32 bits. So there's two to the 32 distinct values that we can store in an int, okay? That's not, that's, that's not small, it's a lot, but it's not infinite, right? And it's finite. And so we have to think a little bit about what do those different byte patterns mean? How do we interpret them? We have a usual way we interpret them, but that doesn't have to be the only way. Uh, we can interpret them in a variety of different ways. So let's take the code that's over here on the right. Pretty simple stuff. The build uh, line four, it's up at the top. That's what the little make line is. And so we're gonna go and grab int types.h. If you're not familiar with int types.h, you see it's in angle brackets, it's a standard part of the world, just like standard io.h. You should be familiar with it because you shouldn't be using int. I mentioned int over here. Don't use int if you don't have to. Uh, use a real type, and we'll see those in just a moment. So we have to use int for main. Okay, int main, int argc. Okay, fine. Char star argv, char star envp. Remember that from our uh, from looking at that particular vulnerability. So let's go ahead and store the value 4 billion, and we're going to store it in an unsigned 32-bit int. And this thing right here, uint32 underscore t, if you're not familiar with it, that comes to us codice of int types dot h, and you really should be using it because it says exactly what it is on the 10. You don't have to wonder about, well, an int, is that 4 bytes, or is that 2 bytes on the, what is that on, no, it's 32 bits, and it's unsigned. 4 billion, so that is three zeros, three more zeros, and three more zeros, and a four. Great, so a four followed by nine zeros. So we'll set that to be the value, we'll print it out, see what it is, and you may be curious about this little guy right here. That is a defined constant, which expands into whatever the correct thing is to put after the percent in order to print an unsigned 32-bit integer. Yeah. You wanted how you print an unsigned 64-bit integer, you put a 64-bit there. Okay. All right. So, and then we put the slash in. Because these are all strings, I can just throw them together like this, and the C compiler will, will create a nice string out of it. So I print out the value, and then I negate it. And I say, okay, negative 4 billion is this. And we'll apply it by 10. 10 times 4 billion, that's 40 billion. And it's, of course, negative because I just negated it. Here's negative 40 billion. By 10 again, here's negative 400 billion. Double it, right? Value plus equal value. Here's negative 800 billion, right? A negative plus another negative is even more negative, And then we're done. Let's run it. 4 billion. That's 4 billion. Negative 4 billion is what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Negative 4 billion is somehow 294 million. Okay, sure. Uh, 10 times that is 2 billion, 949 million. Negative 400 billion is that, and negative 800 billion. Those aren't, those aren't right. What's happening here? Well, C didn't give us any errors, didn't, the compiler didn't complain, and here we are. So the first thing we did wrong, if we go back a slide, is we took an unsigned value and negated it. But it seems like, sure, you do you. And so it gives us, a, it basically tells us that's fine because it turns out on the uh, x86 platform, there's not really a distinction between signed and unsigned values uh, in terms of the instructions. There, there is for like multiplies, in some cases where it matters. But for adding and subtracting, it doesn't matter. That's part of the magic of something called two's complement arithmetic, which we're not going to get into. But sure, you negate it. That's fine. And it has an answer. And that answer happens to be this. Okay, fine. 
we multiply it by 10 that gives us the correct result right we add a zero on the end of, of that thing so that part at least is right multiply it by 10 again and we get the wrong thing multiply it by 2 and we get something that's even more just weirdly wrong okay what's happening is we're overflowing the space we have right multiplying this by 10 works because this value will fit into our 32-bit integer but this value multiplying this by 10 won't and so it silently overflows we lose some bits of precision and we wind up with this same thing happens here this is a problem that plagues all computer languages and uh, over on the right this time is some code written for rust so in rust we go ahead and we assign our value 4 billion and notice we say hey it's an unsigned 32-bit thing this tells rust the type of this constant which in turn tells it the type to assign uh, to value and we print it out this is how you print it out we print out the value and say 4 billion is this we then negate it we print out what negative 4 billion is multiply it by 10 print out what 40 billion 400 billion and 800 billion there you go so let's try it so we try to uh, compile it and Rust says hey you can't apply a unary minus to an unsigned value right that's not okay I'm not gonna let you do that unsigned values can't be negated <gasps> hooray okay so Rust has stopped us from doing that so let's try a little bit harder the problem is the unary minus so let's just try subtracting the value from zero once we do that, once we replace value equal minus value with value equal zero minus value, it compiles just fine. And so now we run it. But wait a minute, it says four billion is this, and then it panics when I attempt to subtract with overflow. What? What? So it's caught me, right? It's caught this zero minus four billion and it says you know what that's gonna that, that's not gonna work I'm not gonna allow that <sighs> dang it you know most of the time when security kicks in one of the easiest ways to defeat any type of security is optimization so let's turn on optimization because that's what we're gonna do when we release the thing right we're gonna test it without optimization and then release it with optimization. So let's, let's go ahead and optimize it now and see what we get. And what we get is the quote unquote correct answer that we expect to get, <laughs> exactly the same answer we got for C with no complaints or discussion uh, from the compiler or from the runtime system at all. Okay, there we go. And, you know, like I said, this plagues all computer languages. Here's some Lisp code. If you've never programmed in Lisp, you're missing out. Lisp is awesome. So we set 4 billion to be our value. We print it out. And you can think of the tilde like the percent. So it's percent D, and then this is a new line. Uh, and so we print it out. We negate it. We multiply it by 10. Multiply it by 10 again, and we double it. We print out each time what it is. And we're using, uh, for this, I used SBCL, which is the steel bank common Lisp. This is the list I happen to have installed on my computer and when I run it I get the right answer what the heck 4 billion minus 4 billion minus 40 billion minus 400 billion 800 <gasps> what okay fine maybe Lisp doesn't have this problem what's happening in Lisp is a little bit funny Lisp only has integers you see nothing back here ever told it this is 32 bits because Lisp figures out how many bits you need to hold something and it automatically promotes you to a higher type when you need to it has fixed length numbers they're called fixed nums in the lisp lingo and it can promote those to arbitrary length integers or big nums whenever necessary and it just starts taking up more and more of your computer memory to hold this bigger and bigger number so from this so we can conclude that because we got this answer and not the crazy answer that Lisp is not a computer language and that therefore we can ignore it. So why are we going through all this? Well, 
some computer languages offer fixed point arithmetic. Now you, I'm sure, are familiar with floating point arithmetic, where you can take 0.5 and multiply it by 0.5 and get 0.25, uh, and that's all fine. But there are places where maybe I really care about the number of positions after the decimal, and I want it to be fixed, like in financial calculations, where I might want it to be two or three or four, depending on what I'm doing, and I don't want it to change. I want the computations to use that number and to do the correct uh, sums and rounding and so forth to make it that number. And there are some very popular, very cool, awesome computer languages that support fixed point arithmetic. They're listed over there, right? PL1, all the kids are programming PL1. COBOL, who doesn't love COBOL? Uh, Ada, Jovial, Coral 66, yeah, we're talking. And of course, SQL is everyone's favorite programming language. The advantage that fixed point arithmetic has is that it avoids what's known as conversion errors, right? So I do some some financial math and I wind up with like 0 0.3333333 and I have to convert it into the appropriate decimal and I can screw that up maybe. So what I need to do is avoid those conversions back and forth. Think about what happens when you store uh, 0.5 in the computer. What happens is it's first converted into binary. That's right, the computer actually stores the binary version of 0.5, okay? It doesn't just store 0.5 somewhere and say it's a half, right? It stores it literally as one half, right? So it, it sticks a one in there and it stores the exponent of minus one. So one times two to the minus one or one half, and that's how it stores it. And it does that for all of these. You wanna store 0.3333, it's gonna convert that into binary and store it in binary. And that conversion to binary, and then the conversion back to decimal to, to print it out or to look at it, can result in errors. Fixed point arithmetic can actually make that better by preventing that conversion, okay? And in some cases, you can do a little better if you don't convert to binary. So think about that. I mean, there, there are clearly some things that have a representation that is, is distinct across different bases. And if I'm trying to convert back and forth between different bases, it's like converting between different languages, right? I, I go into Google Translate and I put something in, I convert it to German, I convert it to uh, Chinese, I convert it to Swedish, I convert it back to English, and it's a mess. Same thing happens in here. Well, if I avoid conversions, maybe I can do better. Some languages provide you with decimal floating point values. That is, internally, they actually store them in decimal. Okay, and there are different ways to do that. Packed BCD is one, uh, but they don't convert it to binary. They keep it as decimal. And you'd be surprised. Python and C Sharp are languages that can support uh, decimal floating point values. Okay, they preserve them in decimal, which is great for financial calculations because we do the financial calculations in decimal. So let's get back to fixed point arithmetic, the concept of fixed point arithmetic. You don't necessarily need fancy types to do fixed point arithmetic. Let's say that we just use integers and nothing else, but we keep track of the number of decimal places. And that's in fact what you do. Think about how you add numbers with decimals, right? You don't have a different algorithm for adding numbers or multiplying numbers with decimals. You multiply them the same way you would multiply the integer values, and then at the end, you account for the position of the decimal, right? If I take 0.5 and multiply it by 0.5, it's still five times five is 25, and then I count the decimal places and I put the decimal in the right spot. So it's really just integer arithmetic with the additional step of figuring out where the decimal should go in the result. So over here on the right, we have some code that does that. I look at in types and standard IO, and I define this little print X. And print X is going to print out for me one of these one of these uh, values uh, in, in decimal. Okay, so it's going to print out this first part, which is a value divided by 100, 
and then the second part is the value percent 100. So it's going to it's going to take an integer and it's going to break it up into the dollars and cents. Here's my main a Samsung Galaxy Chromebook costs 698.78, which I'll represent as 69878. And I just remember that there are two decimal places. I want to buy 15 of them, so I take that, multiply it by 15. What happens to the decimal? Well, it didn't change, right? I count the number of places in the original, which was 2. I count the number here, which is 0, and so the result is 2, which is what I've already got. Tax in Tennessee needs to be applied. So we're multiplying by a number with two fractional places, multiplying it by a number with four. So the resulting value has six fractional places. And we divide by 10,000 to get back to just two places. You may wonder, I don't know how that math works. How can you be, how can that work, right? I'm not following. In fact, this line can be a little confusing to you. Uh, you have to stare at it for a few moments to understand it. So here's my subtotal. Right, has two places. I multiply it by by 9.75 percent sales tax or 0 0.0975. Why do I add 5,000? That's for rounding, right? This, so the result's going to have uh, two places after the decimal, and I want that that I want that second place to round up. So one, two, three, four, and I add that, and it rounds up correctly. And then I remove the bottom four zeros, so I wind up with just two decimal places. Remember the result had six, I removed the bottom four, and now I just have those two. And that works, and I then print out the tax. And then I just add the subtotal and the tax together. They both have two decimal places, so it just adds correctly and the result has two, and I'm good. This will do all of that without ever having to convert it to a floating point value, and it's all precise. It's done with integers. Okay, and when we run it, sure enough, we get 698.78, 15 of them, here's the tax, and here's the total. Beautiful. So is it correct? Is the tax amount correct? I had to think a little bit to put this line together. So ideally, somebody would do that thinking for me and create a library, and in fact, there is such a library right here, libfixed. And this has sort of been carefully thought through to be sure that the right things happen. What are the advantages? Well, I don't convert back and forth. That's one, right? I do convert to binary and back, but I do that only with integers. Conversion of an integer from decimal to binary or binary to decimal is exact in all cases. Conversion of a floating point value from binary to decimal or back is not exact. It's approximate, okay? Another advantage is speed. Integer math is just faster. It's just faster. Precision, I don't shave off any bits anywhere for lose precision. And the third advantage is, of course, speed again, because speed overwhelms everything else. All right, it's location, location, location. On computers, it's speed, speed, speed. So let's assume that we are the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. And believe it or not, that's what NASDAQ stands for. So now you know. Put that away in your head for the next time that you're uh, playing trivia at a bar. And you want to do some financial calculations. So you store the per share price of stocks in a 32-bit integer, right? 2 to the 32 minus 1 is that value. That's way more than the most expensive stock costs. How much is that? Well, those, there's your hundreds, there's your thousands, there's your millions. And there's your four billion, right? Holy cow. Okay, we're going to use two of those positions to hold cents. And so we take two of those off. It says instead of four billion, it's 400 million, 40 million. So look at this. Look at this. It's still, sorry, I did that wrong. Uh, yeah, so we're using four places. I'm getting this wrong. One, two, three, four. There we go. We're going to cut right there uh, because that's what our calculations required. We want to be very precise. $429,000 for a stock. Nearly half a million dollars for a single share of a stock, and that's clearly absurd, right? We're never going to have to worry. We should be fine. Calculations going to be fast. Streaming data is going to be fast. In the world of stocks, you've got to be fast. You've got to be moving. You can't stand still. Trading, trading, making deals. 
And so this will work perfectly until the moment it doesn't. So since stocks always go up, eventually we're going to exceed that limit. And suddenly we're going to be above half a million per stock. But that won't happen for a long time, right? It happens in March of 2021. <laughs> uh, and it happens for the, for the stock Berkshire Hathaway. The price exceeded 435,000 per share, which is larger than the maximum we just computed, and trading of the stock ended up suspended on NASDAQ. Other exchanges did not have this problem. Wow, so this is embarrassing. The price of your stock is going uh, slowly creeping up and up and up and up and up and up, and then bam, it's suddenly down here because you've overflowed your integer value. Wow, well, that's a deal if you want to buy it, and that's horrible if you own it. All right, that's terrible. So you have something like open at $426,000 a share and your low for the day is 94. <laughs> it's not super awesome. Not super awesome. All right, so what's the solution? The solution is to go to a 64-bit integer and that fixes it forever. Never have that problem again. But you can see what's happening, right? So integer overflow. The question is, is integer overflow? Clearly, it's a it's going to cause some problems, but is it a security problem? Well, the code over here is taken straight out of OpenSSH. It's open source code. I just grabbed some of the code out of it and pasted it in here, and here it is. And you can see xmalloc, which I think I mentioned previously in, in the class. Uh, so here it is. Uh, we go ahead and we get an int. If the response is greater than zero, we allocate some space. How much? Well, we take the size of a char pointer, multiply that by the number of responses, and we allocate that much space. And then we loop and we, we copy each packet into the response at slot I. Easy, simple, good stuff, right? There's nothing, did you see anything wrong with that? There's clearly nothing wrong with this code. This is the kind of code that you or I might write to do this. Tell me how much you need, I'll allocate it, and then I'll copy the stuff into it. Well, what happens when the when the size in NRESP is actually close to the limit? Eh, or close to the limit times eight, because the size of a char point is gonna be eight on uh, your Intel platform. Then you might overflow, and instead of allocating a giant chunk of memory, you allocate a tiny little chunk of memory. And then you immediately write a whole bunch of stuff in that overflows it. That's a buffer overflow. <sighs> well, they fixed this problem. They fixed this. And uh, that fixed the integer overflow problem for OpenSSH. And you would assume that once they were bitten by something so bad in, and you know, one of those H's is for the word secure. Once a secure application has fixed a security problem like this, they never let it happen again, and you can be confident of that. And you can, in fact, Google OpenSSH Inner Overflow Vulnerability to see how that they've permanently fixed it, and it never happened a bunch of other times. So, for 17 years in Microsoft Windows, there was a bug. That part's easy to believe. The bug was actually an integer overflow and it occurred in the windows dns server remote uh stuff windows dns server and i've included this article and instead of going through the details of it i'm just going to point you to this article because honestly this article is so good that i'm just going to step back and let this person explain it to you if you want to know how this vulnerability worked, how you could analyze it, just really tons of good stuff about getting into this. This article, which is not a hard read, is really worth your time. Okay, This was reported in July two, uh, 2020, and it's probably been in Windows for about 17 years. And it gets a perfect score of 10 in the uh, CVSS. Bad vulnerability. Here's a link to the uh, information about it. But this article is well worth your time. Integer overflow. Yes, security problems. 
Once a vulnerability is announced, everyone wants to exploit the code, right? Uh, and so here's a fun thing. I created a fake exploit on GitHub minutes after the original blog post was published. I added a binary loaded with canary tokens. What's a canary token? When you run the binary, the binary reports back that it was run. Canary tokens to track who was running the script. And that was from Andy Gill. And so uh, what happened? People grabbed the exploit. Right? These are security people often. They downloaded the exploit off the internet, put it on their machine, and ran it. <laughs> and, uh, and so he published this great article, How Many People Blindly Trust What They Read on the Internet. And uh, sure enough, it's a lot. Uh, uh, so uh, his fake exploit generated real data, uh, which you can read about uh, in his article. Okay, weaknesses occur when an assumption is not enforced and when all inputs are not considered. And you should explicitly document the domain of your functions and you should account for all potential values, right? The problem with that, uh, that piece of OpenSSH code is that they didn't account for large values in that inresp variable where it could potentially overflow. They should have checked for that, or at least defined what that region would be, or taken some steps to assure that it was always in range. Okay. All right, with that aside, let's talk about security models, ways of, of structuring your thoughts and, and discussions about security. And uh, this leads us, of course, back to the question that we keep coming back to, which is, what is security. And in general, security is something like the ability to control who has access to a thing. That's not a great definition. It's a good working definition for us right now. There's lots of ways you can poke holes in that definition and you think about it and you should try to poke holes in it. But, you know, that will, will help us a little bit. Over on the right, you see a prox card reader, which was improperly physically secured, which allows you to pull the plate off, uh, short the wires, and uh, release the uh, lock. I mean, you know, if you were so inclined. So let's think for a minute about something else. Let's think about destruction versus security. Uh, remember the black box. The failure mode for the black box was data destruction. And that was okay. We were fine with that. Is data destruction kind of the same as security, right? If a, if, a, if a place is destroyed or data is erased or your person is killed, can we claim that as security, right? So if the thing doesn't exist, we can't necessarily talk about its security. For security, we assume someone has authority to decide who has access. And the set of people who have access should be non-empty. So if you destroy something, you've destroyed all the ability to access, and you're sort of outside of our model of security. Notice that we destroy papers and documents, not to secure the papers and documents, but to secure the information contained. The papers and the documents are containers for information. Okay, that's important. A file is a container for information. Right? A directory is a container for files. The big tub you see over on the right-hand side there is a container for stuff that we're going to we're going to eventually hopefully shred. Um, and you know, we can think about that security of that for just a moment. Uh, maybe I can pick the lock. Maybe I can use one of those little grabbers, those flexible grabbers, and reach down through that slot and pull papers out. So you know, again, there's no perfect security. So. This is, this is an important thing. Think about containers. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, mechanisms. So there's that little flexible grabber that I mentioned. Uh, our definition of information security says nothing about whether or not a particular thing is secure because security is always in flux. If secrets have value, then there's going to be incentive to violate it. If a secret that may be in that tub is worth millions of dollars to someone, 
and I can buy the little flexible grabber thing for eight dollars wow that's a big return on investment isn't it uh, I will point out the weirdness here that the 79 inch one is like a little over eight dollars the 24 inch one is a little cheaper this 24 inch one is somehow even cheaper the 35 inch one is 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 slightly more expensive but if I want to like triple this almost triple this it's really cheap these this, these these numbers make no sense so there you go be sure and get a good deal when you buy your flexible grabber to steal information all right so back to security there are many different contexts for security and, and there are many different kinds of things to secure and for different reasons and with different outcomes we choose to secure them right the different outcomes of security is violated right we may want to protect the recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken if someone gets that recipe maybe we lose a competitive advantage or today maybe not right who knows if someone steals classified nuclear secrets that's much more severe right that's potentially more harmful right if you or I steal them that's probably not that big a deal right I don't have the means to build a nuclear bomb but I might be able to turn around and sell them to someone who does. And that's not great. So we tend to classify things, classify security levels based on the harm that exposure of the information could do. So this really focuses on one aspect of that, remember that CIA uh, triad, this confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability this is really focusing on confidentiality right? so national security information nsi uh, can be classified as top secret where there is exceptionally grave damage to national security if it's revealed as secret where it's serious damage and as confidential where it's just damage and you may think these are kind of fuzzy words but they are actually there actually is as there always is with the department of defense there are fairly precise definitions of what these words mean to help you determine which category information uh, goes in. And so we're going to look at this because it's instructive to look at this particular model of secrets to help us better understand how to apply security. So let's think about what a security model would be. Security models are going to add rigor and maybe even formalize uh, security and they're going to reveal to us security policies and they'll define security as a usually as a series of constraints let's say to achieve security the following sets of things must be simultaneously true and if they are true then you're secure in the sense that this model defines security so that the definition isn't necessarily directly given it's given it emerges from all the other things that you want to guarantee are true. So a simple model could be, I've locked over here, I insert a coin into, uh, into the system, it unlocks, I push my way through a turnstile, and now it's locked again. Right? This is my turnstile model. Right? So I put a, every time I put a coin in, I can push one person through the turnstile, I can keep putting coins in an unlocked turnstile, but that's silly. I can try to keep pushing the locked turnstile, but I won't get anywhere, there you go. The first model we're going to talk about is the Bell uh, Lepadula model. I'm not sure I'm saying the second name correctly, but uh, it's what I've heard before. So if you determine it's wrong, insert the correct one, the uh, correct pronunciation in your brain. So the Bell Lepadula model focuses on confidentiality. It was created by David Bell and Ben Lepadula for MITRE. MITRE is going to always show up in these things. So just get excited about seeing MITRE. It's a multi-level model of security, and we already saw one. We saw top secret, secret, and confidential. That's a multi-level model of security. And it's a multi-level model of security that structured information into access classes. And these can exist in a total order, like we saw with top secret, secret, and confidential. But in practice, they're often more of a lattice because there are things like compartmentalization or special access rules, right? So you might have top secret information 
but it's it's a it's a specific kind of top secret information distinct from a different kind of top secret information they have their own separate rules uh, TSSCI information for example uh, secure compartmented information there are many different compartments you might have stuff that is sapped as a secure access program uh, and those are very different so they can exist within a, a lattice as opposed to a, a total order lattice is a fancy name for a partial order an object has an access class and contains some information it's a container for information a subject has an access class and may read, write, or both read and write objects. So subject is the person, object is, is the thing holding the data, is one way to think of it. And our model is gonna focus on the container of the information, which probably is gonna be a file, and this is an important distinction, not the information itself, okay? So over here we have a little view of the world, higher levels of security up here lower levels of security are down here the current level of security is right here between these two lines to implement this every container has an access control list that specifies who has access to the file contents and this has to be simple or we get into a state where information can be leaked or access can become uncomputable so for example suppose our acls uh, form a, 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 uh, man, I can't get the word out. I suppose our ACLs, so Bob can, uh, can read file X and he can write file Y and I can read file Y and write file X. Now I have a cycle in here and I can potentially pollute the entire information system and proving that it's secure goes out the window because I have this, this weird recursive property. So we need it to be simple. The Bill of the Padula model follows the DoD guideline of strict levels of security, and it does that to try to avoid the problem I just described. It has three properties. The first one is the simple security property, which says a subject can only read an object if the access class of the subject dominates the access class of the object. Dominates is there because of the potential for lattices, but you can think of that very simply as a subject can read down to a lower level of security, but cannot read up, right? If I have a secret clearance, I can read confidential information, I can read secret information, but I can't read top secret information. That should be moderately intuitive. But, but, stay with me, what if I let the subject write classif classified information to a lower level. So I'm allowed to read, let's say, secret information, and I'm also allowed to read classified information. What if I write some of that secret information into a merely classified file, right? Because the information is one thing, the files are containers. So I take secret information from a secret container and I put it in a classified container. I've leaked information. I don't want that, don't want that. So we introduce a second property, which we call the star property. A subject can only write to an object if the, ob if the object dominates the access class of the subject. Another <clears throat> lattice thing. Basically, I can write my secret information to a secret file, or I can write my secret information to a top secret file, and that's it. I can't leak information down. So information can't leak down to me, and I can't leak information down to something else. And if you think about this, what that says is information can't go down, right? I can read down, but I can't write down. I can only write up. And so information moves to a, I mean, I can, I can write to the same level, obviously, but information tends to move up in this. It drifts upward to higher and higher classification levels, and that's probably not right. I, I may need a way to get some of the information at a higher level and push it down to a lower level at some point. Maybe it gets, the classification gets revised, Maybe it's overclassified. Maybe it's just wrong. So to do that, we need a special kind of subject, and that is the privileged user who can also write down. So immediately we realize our simple model is too simple and too rigorous and too secure. I got to break it by introducing someone who can break the rules. I have to add a super user. 
that's going to be a recurring theme in this. Uh, just have to get used to that idea. The third one is, what about read and write? Well, clearly since I can't read up, and since I can't write down, I shouldn't be able to read and write either up or down. That's the strong star property, which says I can only read and write stuff at my own level. Okay. This model is what we would call a mandatory access control model. It's a, it's a model where access control is managed centrally. Right? Somebody is making a decision, someone called a derivative classifier or an original classifier is making a decision about where information should live in this system and then the rules are set up to preserve the, the integrity of that, to, sorry, to preserve the confidentiality of that information. Uh, and it's unusual to have different compartments at equal levels, of course. Or sorry, it's usual to have, just said this wrong, it's usual to have different compartments at, at equal levels. I mentioned SCI, I mentioned SAP programs. So what we really need is something that where the end user has a little more control, and we would call that discretionary access control. And that's a model where access control is managed by the owners of an object, right? Under mandatory access control, you can sort of think the there is a set of overseers who manage everything. With discretionary access control, we push some of that down uh, to the users. This is a formal model, and in fact, if you read uh, the original paper, and uh, or you read the more recent one, looking back, uh, you'll find formal definitions of all this stuff where they are specified as state machines. And it's surprising how formal this stuff is. So you see over here the basic security property. So W is a cross product of all these sets, and it builds an automaton, and then it proves things about that automaton. The details of the theorems are in the original paper, but you know you can go find them also in the in looking back. And the fact that it's a very formal model allows me to make very strong statements backed up by mathematical proofs about the security properties of the system. And if you correctly implement it so that all the basic assumptions are met and you know they're satisfied, those theorems are going to hold and you're going to be secure in this way. What happens if an object changes its classification? Right? It used to be top secret, but now it's secret. Or it used to be secret, but now it's top secret. How do we deal with that? Well, we don't. Uh, we're not sure how to handle this without leaking information. Uh, for example, a subject suddenly loses access to an item. Let's say I'm a, I have a secret clearance and I used to be able to access this one document now it tells me I can't. That tells me that its security classification has changed. And maybe I have a local cached copy of it, which means I may have in my cache top secret information, even though I only have a secret clearance. That's neat. That tells me something. Uh, and it's leaked top secret information to me. Oh, okay. So this was a question that they brought up when they were building this model. And here's the quotation from David Bell. We were directed to exclude dynamic changes of classification from our investigations. Okay. We were told, eh, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. It's not important. And he said explicitly, this removes all interest from the problem. Right? Basically, if you're not allowed to move things around, the problem ceases to be an interesting, fun problem to work on, and it becomes fairly trivial. And you, you can tell about the three rules. This was formalized as the tranquility principle. The tranquility principle says that the classification of a subject or of an object does not change. So your clearance doesn't change and the clearance of information doesn't change while the system is in operation. Okay, or at least while it's being referenced. And once it has no longer got any references anywhere, we can move it around, but uh, we can't move it around while it's being referenced. The strong tranquility principle says easiest way to do that is to not allow anything to change while the system is operating. We'll shut it down, rejigger some stuff, and then bring it back up. The weak tranquility principle prohibits a change that would invalidate a policy. So I have a cached copy lying around. 
that means I can't reclassify that thing until all the linkages to it have gone. The original paper is of considerable interest because it's, it's historically important. Uh, and it has many fundamental concepts that will show up later on. It was the foundation of two very, very important developments. If you've never heard of them, uh, they are unbelievably influential even today. One is the Orange Book, right? So-called because it's covered with orange. It's part of the Rainbow series, and this one happened to be orange. And uh, you can see trusted computer system evaluation criteria from 1985 in this case. Very influential document, still influential today. The other is Multics. Multics is an operating system. It survived until around 2000, and it gave us a lot of innovations. Dynamic linking, virtual memory, SMSP, the first commercial relational database, hot swapping of stuff like CPUs and memory, all of that uh, came to us through Multics. And so it's very innovative and very important in the history of computing. So, are we done? Are all the problems solved? We have a model. Let's just make everything Bell Lepadula secure and we're done. The focus is on confidentiality, but not much else. How do I know the information's integrity has been preserved? How do I know that stuff is available when I need it? Those aren't addressed by this. Maybe they, maybe it is, maybe it's not, right? I could say you're only allowed to read down, you're only allowed to write up. That's a positive statement. But actually what the model says is you can't read up and you can't write down. That's what it says. So if you combine those, you wind up with over here in this case, and that maybe means that stuff that you would think should be available, like down here at the lower level, if I just deny you access to it, I could have satisfied that property. So that's not great. Uh, dynamic changes in classification do happen, and you can't ignore them. Right? Maybe the documents are, have been declassified. Right? Maybe the president thought about a document is potentially being declassified, and that's good enough to declassify it, maybe. It's not. There actually are congressional, so Congress has something to say about it. Uh, laws can be passed. The law can say that Congress, through its power as a co-equal branch of government, has ruled this information declassified, and that information would be nuclear information. Uh, and so nuclear information has a very specific congressionally determined process by which it gets released and it can't just be arbitrarily released uh, by the president. The model is also inflexible, right? Utility from the Parkerian hexad is not even, that's not addressed. We don't know about that. And writing down requires a special user who can do anything, which that's not maybe great. It doesn't address the data aggregation or the metadata problems, right? Maybe I can collect all the information at this level and all the information at this level and by collecting it all together, I reveal stuff that I shouldn't know. Become a problem. Uh, so data may be unclassified individually, but, but classified in aggregate. And information about data may be classified, even though the data itself isn't. A piece of data might be over here, be just fine by itself. And a piece of code over here might be fine by itself. But if you learn that I'm using this code, to analyze this data, you may learn something I don't want you to know. Okay, and of course, the real real challenge here is that math is hard, and the Bell Lapadula model is very mathy. Confidentiality focuses on keeping secrets and limiting access to information. The Bell Lapadula model focuses solely on confidentiality, and this is probably the right approach for some systems but it ignores availability, integrity, and all the other pieces that we've talked about. Great, that's one model. Let's talk about the BIBA model. About the same time, some of the same motivations. Instead of focusing too much on confidentiality, let's focus on data integrity, okay? Trust can be organized into a hierarchy, just like confidentiality, right? The lower level 
of the lower the level of a user, the less trusted they are, right? Maybe I can provide some information and it's trusted at one level, but maybe if uh, uh, you, know, you provide the information, it's trusted at a lower level down here. Now maybe I'm more trusted. Or maybe I'm less trusted and you're more trusted. We, we sort of figure out what people are on that hierarchy and we put them in their category and then we figure out you know, the information that I generate let's say, is less trusted than the information that you generate because you're a more trusted individual. So your information is more trusted. All right. In the Bell Lepadula model, we might say an object is only as secret as the highest level user who has right access to it. All right. So only as secret as the highest level user who has right access to it. The simple integrity property says a subject can only read an object if the object dominates the trust class of the subject. So I can read up, but I can't read down. So I'm allowed to read information at my level, same level of trust that I am, but I'm also able to read information that's at a higher trust level because right, it's more, it has more integrity. But if I could read down, I would read, reach down to less trusted information and I might, that would pollute my level with untrusted information, with less trustworthy information. And I don't want that. The information at the lower level could contaminate the information at my level, breaking my trust model. Don't want that. So I'm only allowed to read information that's at least as trusted as my level. Likewise, I can't, I can't write up I can't take my crappy information and write it up to a higher level where there's more trust. I can only write down or write at my level, right? So I can't pollute the higher level information with my less trusted information. So all of this works to preserve integrity. When you combine those read and write together, that's the strong star property. Nope, can't happen. Only at my level can I have both read and write. Another example of mandatory access control, right? Because we're determining where, what level each, each subject and each object need to be. It's gonna have the same problem as the uh, bell Lepadula model. It's gonna need to have the tranquility principle applied or things will get out of hand. Is this useful? It's the exact opposite of the bell Lepadula, right? The concepts in this model are actually used in FreeBSD and in the XGS 400 secure operating system uh, and in General Dynamics Pitbull trusted operating system. Here's, a, here's an image from there. All right, standard operating system is these chunks. Standard operating system after attack, you blow a hole in it, the whole thing sinks. But with our Pitbull trusted system, you blow a hole in it, it stays afloat, right? damage is contained because of the way the system manages trust. <clears throat> Integrity focuses on assuring that information is trustworthy and accurate, and Biba focuses only on integrity. And this is, in fact, the right approach for some systems. So now we've talked about confidentiality in the Bell Lepadula model, and we've talked about integrity in the Biba model. Let's bring things together. These are both information flow models. They are essentially state machine models, in fact, explicitly state machine models. And they introduce constraints where they say, you can't do this, right? They, the constraints are, are negative constraints. They say, you're not allowed to do this. And they are there to prevent unauthorized disclosure in the Bell Apagula model or data pollution in the Biba model. And here they are side by side. And you can immediately see something interesting about this, right? Confidentiality, integrity, these models are the opposites of each other, right? Bell Lepadula says, read down, write up. Biba says, read up, write down. Bell Lepadula says, do not read up and do not write down. Biba says, do not read down, do not write up, right? What if we want both? Can we have both? Are they in conflict? It seems like if we put them together, everything falls into this strong star property and we're not allowed to do anything except at our level we're very stove piped and, and things don't work. 
Bella Paglio says no write down to preserve confidentiality. If a subject could write down, they could leak. Beaver model says no write up to preserve integrity. If a subject could write up, they could corrupt uh, more trusted artifacts. If we want both integrity and confidentiality, and we do, do we have to disallow both write up and write down? And if we do, do we ever get anything done? Are we doomed? So modern systems that have multiple levels of security need to allow some way to accomplish both of those. And the usual way to do this is maybe not great. Uh, we allow write down, but not up. We allow read down, but not up. And we add a super user so someone's at the top. So in other words, we break both models. Allowing write down, that's the Bell de Padula way, not up. We allow read down, that's the Biba way, but not, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting this, I'm getting this backwards. There, there. We allow write down, <laughs> which is the Biba way, sorry, and read down, which is the Bella Padula way, and then we explicitly break uh, the Bella Padula and the Biba models. Okay, so everything goes in one direction. And what could go wrong? Well, these are the things that go wrong, right? Having a super user is not always perfect. Let's take a look at this. Here I'm root. I just like this. If I try to do this, it's going to tell me, hey, it's dangerous to operate recursively on slash. So you should use no preserve root to override this so that I do this and there's no follow up to this because now I've deleted root. <laughs> this is another thing. Don't do any <laughs> don't do the things you see on this slide. Don't do them. It says fun. It's really not fun. Uh, other models. So we're going to discuss some other models. And I want you to keep all this in mind as you think about these models. The beautiful thing about the Bell, the Padulet, and the Beaver models is they were so simple. You can see all the pieces. And you can understand why they are the way they are. And you can also see where they're in conflict. And so the question is, can we develop a model where we're guaranteed confidentiality and integrity, ideally also availability? Or are these doomed to be eternally in conflict? There's homework, new homework. The homework is to construct an attack tree for stealing a car. So your goal up at the very top of your tree is steal a car. It can be a particular car if you want. And I want you to try to be as complete as possible. So the next slide is going to show you an attack surface. You've seen it before. I want you to follow the attack, the uh, divide and conquer approach we have in the class. If you decide some approaches are impossible, just mark them as impossible and move on. I, I, simple, I did actually simplify the attack model a bit, use a simpler version of it. There you go. A few points to discuss here. Smartphones have cellular and Wi-Fi and near-field communication, and they also communicate with a human. The remote link type app, the heck is that thing? Well, that's something like OnStar. OBD2 port over here, what is that? All right, that's a port on the car. Usually, if you're sitting in the driver's seat, to your left and down, there's a little panel you can pull off and you can plug something in. Some cars have dedicated short-range communications, that's DSRC. It's a radio in the car that lets them talk to other cars or to highway infrastructure. Passive keyless entry is near-field communication, that's RF. Remote key is RF. There's a tire pressure measurement sensor in uh, redundant, like an ATM machine, tire pressure, TPMS sensor in every tire that communicates over RF. And there's an engine control unit. What is that? That is a computer. So the uh, uh, ECU, 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 those are all little computers. Consider if the doors were locked. Maybe the doors aren't locked. Consider you have to start the car to steal it. Do you have to start a car to steal it? Do you have to open the car doors to steal it? And here's a fun question to think about. Do you have to move the car to steal it? So that's a fun thing to think about. For our purposes, we're going to say yes. You must do all three. You have to, you have to move the car, open the doors, steal the car if, in, in some order in order to accomplish this. But in reality, the answer to all three of those is no. You can explicitly disregard something, but you need to make a note that you're disregarding it and try to be as thorough as possible because you really want to steal this car.
All right. When you have questions, uh, email me. Good luck.